Um, <clears throat> so up next on the schedule, we've got Gunnard Ingebreth from Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Gunnard is a 20 year old veteran of the development world starting back in the dot com boom of the 2000s. Gunnard has grown his IT knowledge from back end development to systems admin to even IBM call center support. Gunnard now lives in Madison and works as a senior developer for an ISP. Uh, today, Gunnard is uh, going to give us an introduction to OWASP or OWASP or the Open Web Application Security Project. I've actually never said that out loud, so I'm curious how you're going to pronounce it. Um, keeping up to date on current security threats is a full-time job. As a developer, you already have one. OWASP is a community-based team of security experts that can influence the way you code future projects, analyze your current code, and grow as a developer. Everyone give it up. We're gunnered. Thank you. Take it away. All right. All right. Thank you very much for that. And uh, interestingly enough, I am not 20 years old. That's how it, I, I at least heard that. I am. I wish I was 20 years old, but, you know. All right. Uh, give me a thumbs up if we can see that screen. All right. Cool. cool. So, yeah, I am. Uh, I've been developing for about 20 years. And during that time, 20 years ago was the whole dot com boom. Um, for me, and that's when I started. And man, there's been so much change in the world. And as a developer, we've kind of, at least I have, we've kind of had this fight between doing code, getting code out quickly. Deadlines are always running, you know, super short, scope creep everywhere. And sometimes we all, you know, don't raise your hand. I know we're, we're not going to admit it here, but sometimes you don't really sanitize those variables when they come in from the URL. Sometimes we don't check things before we put them directly into the database. Now, we all wish that we could, but sometimes you just have to get it done. So <clears throat> with that being said, how do we fix that kind of mentality? How do we get it to where people can understand that it does take time to get this stuff done? And here are the things that we need to do and here's why. So this is where I think as a developer, OWASP is a useful tool to have because you can bring it to presentations, to meetings, you can talk to VPs, executives, project stakeholders and say, this is why we need to do this. This is why we need to take another week of development. This is why we need to go back and look at this application and actually fix our legacy code or roadmap out a new framework um, so let's get into what OWASP is and how you can use it to your advantage as a developer. So who am I? So I kind of gave a little bit of that, but Gunnar Engelbreth, Madison, Wisconsin, been developing for 20 years. Here is all my stuff. And honestly, I found this out. If you just Google the name Gunnard, you can find me, you can get in contact with me, with me. Um, so out on a limb down there, I write articles as well for, um, you know, industry publications. During quarantine, I've been running a, uh, with some other people, a film festival, actually a weekly film festival, campbloodfilmfestival.com. Um, and like was stated, I work for an ISP. It's called Power Code here in Wisconsin. So these slides also are available on gunner.org slash 200 OK. So... Now let's jump into it. So what do we get into here is what is OWASP? We're going to talk about the history, like who they are. Do these people just come out of the blue right now? What are their credentials? You know, how <laughs> I would say raise your hand, but like who's ever heard of OWASP? And to be fair, I hadn't heard of them until a couple of years ago when the company I was working for had a security presentation come in for all of the devs and just opened up this whole world to me. Um, so it's okay if you've never heard of OWASP, we won't hold that against you. Um, and one of the things I'm gonna focus in on is the OWASP top 10. Uh, this isn't necessarily like a late night show top 10, but this is, these are the top 10 crucial things 
that developers and just companies in general should know if you're running a website that's um, even a brochure website is exposable to hacking. But if you, you know, especially if you run an e-commerce store, if you're doing anything that is touching a database, basically on the internet, um, you need to know about all of these threats. So I'm going to focus in on an example, which is the um, XML external entities, which I just think is cool. Everyone's heard of, you know, some of these like injections and uh, across, you know, XSS. Um, but I'm going to touch on this one real quick. Then we're going to talk about prevention of some of these top tens. And then the mentality of, as a developer, how can we be proactive versus reactive? Nobody wants that call at two in the morning that their database has been you know, compromised. So how can you pro be proactive and at least reduce that to a small amount percentage of you know, a possibility? And then we're gonna get into some fun stuff. Um, this would be a live demo um, because of course we all like that high excitement for live things failing, but I have screenshots today. But we're gonna get into like the mind of an attacker, how as a developer, sometimes we get our blinders on. I say sometimes, every time we get blinders on and code works perfectly. It works exactly how we intended it. Great, that's not what, they are looking at this like, all right, where'd they mess up? What can we do? How can I fuzz this? So, there are a couple tools that OWASP gives you that can get you into that mentality and thinking to where, and it might not necessarily be even your code that you're checking, but your team's code or coworkers, somebody's code. Um, and you can start thinking like them instead of looking at your code, like does it work or does it not work? And then going and fixing it real quick. All right. So the history of OWASP. OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project. Um, it launched in 2001 and it became a nonprofit profit in 2004. So they have, you know, over 20 years or 20 years of history. And <clears throat> what I want you to look at here is kind of um, where their foundations are in their mentality. So their principles, they, as they state are, you know, they're open. Everything at OWASP is radically transparent from our finances to our code. They're global. Anyone around the world, anywhere can join and participate in the community. Um, there's no, no certifications, no licenses, no fees, none of that stuff. Um, innovative, which is just kind of the hacker mentality. Um, they encourage and support innovation, experiments and solutions for software security challenges. That sounds good. That sounds like a great thing to be a part of. And integrity. Of course, respectful, supportive, truthful, and vendor neutral. So with all of that being said, even though you might never have heard of them, given these principles here, how could you not to bash anybody, but let's say like a Norton or a McAfee, do they have these principles? You know, what are they? They're, they're a company, a for-profit company. Um, nothing against that, not bashing capitalism, but I would prefer to look at something like this just because they don't really have anything to gain from this. They're a nonprofit. They're out here doing, doing the good for the people, doing the good for us to make our lives easier as developers. Okay, so if you were to venture to the OWASP page, they have a lot of, a lot of information there, um, a lot of just good practical use cases for security and securing your, your application. Now, they're not necessarily a place that you would go if you're looking for the latest CBE, if you're looking up and trying to search different exploits that are already available. This is more of a community page <clears throat> to encourage and support the uh, security community. So one of their projects that they have and they're most famous for is the OWASP top 10, like I was, like I said earlier. So let's look at this. The top 10 is a standard awareness document for developers of web application security. It represents a broad consensus about the most critical security risks to web applications. So they look at everything 
they're vendor neutral, like they stated. They're um, they're um, um, code language um, agnostic. They don't care what you code it in. They're looking at all around security for web applications. And they're not necessarily looking at just big companies. Like when Target went down, you know, they were aware of those security flaws before all of that. They don't just focus on the big Fortune 500 companies. They care about the mom pa WooCommerce store that's set up as much as Target. So what the top 10 will get you are some ideologies and concepts that, again, start to bring this security mentality into your toolbox that when you're developing and you're figuring out your algorithm or you know what you need to do, these things start popping up in your head, like, oh, where are these variables coming from? What systems am I touching with this? Is this, is this query the best that it could be? How am I protecting this query? Um, and again, platform agnostic. I don't care if it's Java, C Sharp, PHP, uh, Delphi, whatever. If you're on Linux, if you're on Microsoft, no matter. Most of these are the bigger concept hacks. Um, not down to the specifics. You can go and Google how to find a specific hack anywhere. But if you want to be able to control the methodology and protect your system from a you know 30,000 foot level, here's where you go. So I put this in here because I've used this before. Um, if you're trying to, again, explain timelines for projects, what you need, what you don't need, if you're trying to um, prove your case to your manager or to somebody else in, within your company, this, what these hacks do are multi-departmental. They will affect your sales. They will affect your, um, your business in general, every department, your marketing, if they put out something that has a hack in it or that has a vulnerability in it, they're going to be affected. You're affected because you have to fix it. And then your company's affected because you've just lost sales or you've lost, you know, you've lost customers because you got hacked. So this does affect everybody in your company. So you can bring this to the table when you're trying to fight for something. And again, personally, I believe this is a reputable source. Been around for 20 years, you know, in the IT world, that's a pretty good lifespan. All right, so let's get into one of the top 10 here injection we've all we've all kind of heard of injections um and this is where you know typically it's sql but injection flaws such as sql no sql os and ldap injection occur when untrusted data is sent to an interpreter as part of a command or query so interpreter any one of your languages that you're using and what what the concept here is that while we develop our own code, we know what we're sending in and out and passing, <clears throat> passing through. But when somebody injects something in there, who knows what can happen? They can throw in some you know, malicious code and all of a sudden they get all your passwords from the database. No good. So almost any source of data can be an injection vector. Environment variables, parameters, external, internal web services, and all types of users. Even, even the users, the user's name. If you've never heard of Little Bobby Tables, go, once we're done here during lunch, go Google Little Bobby Tables. Um, so injection flaws occur when an attacker can send hostile data to an interpreter. I wish that they would go in there and you know send some kind of injection that would give everybody amazing credit scores. It's typically not what they do. So we're gonna call it, thank you, Dylan. Yeah, Little Bobby Tables. Um, typically, hostile, malicious is the intent of the injections. So injection flaws are very prevalent, particularly in legacy code. So we all know this. Even it's 2020 right now. Awesome. By the time we get to 2025, we'll look at our 2020 code and go, oh, why are we writing stuff like that? So think about your legacy code that you, we all know that is sitting back there. We have those legacy functions. We have legacy um, classes that are sitting out there that we just, we know we should fix. We know we need to fix, but well, they work and we don't have time. 
So there's one big use case to go to your manager and say, we need to spend time on this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, injection vulnerabilities are often found in SQL, LDAP, or XPath. Uh, any database query, OS commands, XML parsers, basically anything that takes any kind of input from the web whatsoever, any form that has post or get or put or patch or delete, anything that you can send uh, a data packet to is vulnerable. And the way that people find these are impressive programs, scanners and fuzzers. We used to call them script kitties back in the day, but now it's a profession and you can sit there with a with Nmap, with um, Metasploit, and scan and you can just scan a website and it'll come back and tell you exactly what's open, what's not open, what services are running, um, where there's a potential for a vulnerability. So you don't even have to sit there all night with your you know, Mountain Dew and Red Bull and hit websites. You can just run a script, go to bed, wake up the next morning and you'll have a list of all the things that you need. It's kind of like war dialing back in the day. So here's a standard injection example. So example.com app account view ID equals, and we got a tick or one equals one. So the injection is the or one equals one. And what that does to a query is no matter what is in the ID equals, if it's, you know, username, password, if it's getting some kind of, um, you know, product data. Uh, this one's account view. So we're going to get account data from a customer probably. If anything is invalid, like if your password is invalid, typically what that would do is return, oh, password invalid. We're going to, you know, not authenticate you, you're done. But if you inject in or one equals one, well, what is one equals one? It's true. So if all of this big query or, or true, then return this data. So it's kind of a simple thing there. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's a fun one. That's been around forever, but that's as simple as it has to be. You know, I'm not trying to scare people if you know they've never heard of these things, but this isn't a mastermind like CIA basement full of people. This is very simple stuff. And if you protect against it, you don't have to be afraid of it. So yeah, I just explained that. And of course, more dangerous attacks could modify or delete data or even invoke store procedures. You could do a lot of damage with, you know, really, really specific queries. Um, so the, to go back to that real quick, one of the OWASP or WASP top tens are injections. So they're just, they're classifying that out there. Another one here is insufficient logging and monitoring. Um, I'm an advocate for logging. I mean, most, most services do. If you run Apache or Nginx, there's always an Apache or Nginx log. <clears throat> PHP, there's a PHP log. Uh, MySQL, same thing. When you hit an error or when something is going on, most people turn to the code. If you know PHP isn't working and the page comes up, uh, it just comes up wrong. You don't know where to go. Typically, they go straight to the code and look at that code again and try to figure out what was wrong with it. I always go to the log files, tail a log file, hit the error again, and it'll tell you exactly which file is there, what is missing, and what the error is. Same thing with Apache or Nginx. It'll tell you exactly what happened. Now, knowing that after the fact is OK, and that's cool, but these logs can also be monitored real time and there are systems in place to do that. Um, exploitation of insufficient logging and monitoring is the bedrock of nearly every major incident. Attackers rely on the lack of monitoring and timely response. They know that you are not checking your logs. They know that you might not even know where they are in your server. That's the IT's guy's problem. I just write my Java code. I don't care. Um, so they, they Attackers rely on this to achieve their goals without being detected. If I'm gonna attack your site, I'm gonna attack it for a week to like sniff around and see what's going on. I might do it at two o'clock in the morning. I might only do it for half an hour and I might set a time to where, or um, 
set a variable to where I do it every 10 minutes so that I'm not hitting your site in a big chunk of, I'm not hitting your site all at once and you're seeing me, um, you're seeing all these errors come out. But if you're not looking at your log files, you're not gonna see that anyways. When I was working at a um, unnamed company here in Wisconsin, we would, our website would be slow. We'd get different things. Um, Nginx would, would quit on us. And I started tailing the logs and I would put in some, some little um, variables here in my tail so that things would come up in different colors. I would group IP addresses and we found out that we were getting slammed by a Chinese IP address. Now this company specifically only sold to the United States. We didn't sell internationally at all. So there's no reason for an IP address in China to be hitting us A and that many times in a row. Well, this was after two days of this incident happening and nobody, not even the IT guys looking at it, nobody was looking at the logs. This could have gone on for months and months and months. They could have collected a ton of data and well, that's bad. So get in the habit of tailing your logs, knowing where they are and seeing what's normal when a log is scrolling by, it's kind of like the matrix, but if you look at it for a little while, you'll be able to see the patterns that are normal. You'll be able to see when an IP hits you 10 times in a row and you get an error versus what normal traffic looks like. So that's one of the, the ways to get around that. One strategy um, is to examine logs following a pen test. Now that's, so that's already a saying that we're gonna have a pen test on our site. Let's, let's do this. Of course, look at the log files afterwards and you'll know when they were attacking you, when they were sniffing you. And you can keep that in mind for later when you see those patterns again. So yeah, like I was saying, most successful attacks start with the vulner vulnerability probing. That's where they're just looking out every five minutes at two o'clock in the morning, just to check. Um, here we go, fun fact, in 2016, Identifying a breach took an average of 191 days. Um, so that's a long time. And that's when you get those reports on the news of Equifax or something being hacked. Well, man, well, that, did that happened today. No, that happened last summer, you know? And you're like, why did it take a year for this to get out now that my credit card was stolen a year ago? Uh, or my, my social security number was stolen a year ago. Well, this is why they didn't even know. All right, so another one on the uh, OWASP top 10. And if you're in the WordPress community at all, you already know about this, but using components with known vulnerabilities. Now this makes sense if let's say, this is common knowledge if you're buying a house would you buy a door that has a big hole in it? No, but you can see the hole. You know, it's easy. Everybody can reach their hand in and open up the door with the hole. If you're installing a plugin, that's a gallery plugin for your WordPress site and it works and it looks great. And there, you see that a hundred thousand other people have downloaded it. It works, it's great. Well, what if there's a major security flaw in that? Now you've just welcomed a hole into your website and you know you literally click the thumbs up button and you installed it. So, you know how do you how do you get around that? It's kind of tough, but in the WordPress community, one of the main mantras is keep everything up to date. Good thing is that plugin developers are constantly putting out plugins, almost annoyingly, to where every day you have to keep updating and updating and updating. But what that's doing is keeping you on top of everything. You can go to your customers and clients and say. We're all up to date, we're good. You can run some other scans too, but the main point is don't install things or do a little research before you install or use components within your framework or your, your applications. Um, don't use them if they have known vulnerabilities. Sometimes we can't help it. Sometimes it's sudo within Linux that has a vulnerability. That just happened a little while ago. What can you do about that? Well, nothing. That is kind of after the fact. Once they put out a new release, update it quickly. But you have to keep aware of these things. You can't just go into work, clock in code, and then clock out. 
read those other websites, read Hacker News, you know, stay on Reddit, figure out what's going on in your world to know what are the most vulnerable um, components out there and if you're using them or not. So pre prevalence of this issue is very widespread. Component heavy development patterns can lead to development teams not even understanding which components they use. <sighs> Have you ever had to purge an application because you are using a million jQuery plugins? You have a calendar, you have form validation, uh, you have auto scrolling on your page because you hate people. Um, you have uh, several things that compress your images when they're uploaded. You're using so many components that when you get a new developer on your team, you have to spend an entire two hour meeting just to tell them what you're using. Now, it's kind of the world we live in now, but you can still, you are still the owner of this project and this application. And if you have the OWASP top 10 and this knowledge behind you, you can make a case for consolidating, for rolling your own, not just trusting blindly what's out there on the interwebs. So um, yeah, and some scanners help in detection. There are some things that can help you figure out if you are vulnerable or not, um, but really determining this this the exploitability requires additional effort so like i said it's kind of the world we live in and we do have to be a little bit proactive on this this is not just a one and done install it and it works great move along this is keeping up to date with these things a little responsibility as developers So yeah, just reiteration here. Some, while some known vulnerabilities lead to only minor impacts, some of the largest breaches to date have relied on exploiting known vulnerabilities and components. So and just depending on what they're protecting or what you have on your website, that's what's exposed. That's what you can lose. All right, so cross-site scripting. Um, this is kind of like injection. Um, this can lead to an injection attack. But automated tools, this is very easy. Automated tools can detect and exploit all of the forms of XSS. And they're also freely available exploitation frameworks. I mentioned Metasploit earlier. Metasploit is fantastic for the um, InfoSec community. They install it, you run different, <clears throat> different modules, and they attack a site and return back all these beautiful reports saying, yes, this is open, this is vulnerable go here and attack. So a lot less time is spent on their end trying to figure out how to attack. Um, but that also means that these are available to everybody. But that also means they're available to everybody. As a developer, why aren't you running Metasploit against your application to figure out where it's vulnerable? A lot of times, I know personally, I've been there where it, it's in my head, it's like, well, I'm just creating more work for myself. Well, yes, you are creating more work for yourself, but you're ensuring that your application is secure. Uh, second most prevalent issue on the OWASP top, OS, uh, OWASP top 10 is found in around two thirds of all applications. And yeah, it's a, a agnostic to what code you're developing on. All of the frameworks, all of the code are vulnerable. Um, <clears throat> and like most of the other ones, <clears throat> the impact is severe to not really, but either way, they're getting, especially with the cross-site cross scripting, where they um, focus in on are on the browser itself. So all your cookies, all your history. When um, Chrome tells you, do you want me to save that password? Do you want me to save that credit card? Those are all saved in sessions and um, values and variables. And those are all vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So it's important information that is available out there. Um, another one, security misconfiguration. So that's kind of generic and out there, but it makes sense as well. If your security is misconfigured, then, well, that's a pretty good attack vector for someone to go in on. Um, 
Attackers will often attempt to exploit unpatched flaws or access to false accounts, unused pages, unprotected files or directories, et cetera, to gain unauthorized access or knowledge of the system. If I go to pants.com and I want to I want to attack it, um, what can I do? I can go to slash WP dash admin. That'll tell me if it's a WordPress site and I can go on that knowledge from there. I can just go to slash admin and I'll know there'll be a form there maybe and I'll know what I need to start attacking with. Do they have a username and password? What is that file connected to? Is it connected to any JavaScript? Um, basically having, having those things open and easily accessible and guessable on the web is just an open door for people to at least get their foot in. They might not have direct access to your website, the back end, um, but it's a good starting point. Um, security misconfiguration can happen at any level of an application stack, including the network services, platform, web server, application server, database, frameworks, custom code, and pre-installed virtual machines, containers, or storage. Um, automated scanners are useful in detecting misconfigurations, use of default accounts or configurations, unnecessary services, legacy options, et cetera. They don't even continue to list them because it's literally everything. You can have the best, most secure through HTTPS, through a VPN website that, that requires you know, OAuth and all of that to log in. But if you have an open Telnet port on the server, or if your FTP account is um, anonymous with no password, I don't care about any of that front end connection. I can get into your back end now. And that's just a big security misconfiguration. So like they said, it's on all parts of the stack. You can only do so much depending on your company. You just have control over your application and the programming of it. That's great. Do your part there. If you have more, I know I've worn several hats before from network all the way up to, you know, front end CSS. Do what you can, but be aware that at any point, no matter how secure you think things are, there's always a possibility of another part just being wide open that no one's even looking at. And that's exactly what hackers are kind of betting on. All right, broken access control, it's pretty much the same. All of these, like, I hope you're picking up on kind of a pattern here. The security mindset needs to be a holistic view of everything in your stack, system, code, to user level access. So, you know, access control is detectable using many means, scanners like we were talking about, um, an absence of access controls um, in certain frameworks lead obviously to exploits. So access control weaknesses are common due to the lack of automated detection and lack of effort, uh, effective functional testing by application developers. Uh, big fancy words for, you know, you might, you might not, you do a QA on your application, but are you really trying to hack it? Are you really putting in um, letters when it asks for your telephone number or your social security number? Are you putting in numbers when it asks for letters? Are you putting in white spaces or ASCII characters, uh, UTF-8 code, things that could break your, uh, your code? I've said it before, but we get our blinders on to where after a week of working on a project, we just want that project to be done. We're not looking to make more work for ourselves, but what that does is opens up all of these um, attack vectors to hackers. And again, the impact is as severe as the connection point, as severe as what you have behind there. Do you have credit card numbers behind there? Or you, do you have to-go orders that, you know, tell me that, that I like to order, you know, grilled cheese sandwiches? You know, to each person, it means different things, but any amount of data that's leaked is important and should not happen. Um, broken authentication. I feel honestly like a broken record at this point. 
So attackers have access to hundreds of millions of valid usernames and passwords. This is actually something different. I apologize for that. This is, this is really good. So as we kind of all know, there's those, um, <clears throat> we've seen the commercials for like LifeLock and things like that that offer the dark web scanning. And that's a great promotional tool. And I love, I love hearing all of that. Um, but what it really means are when something does hack and, or something does happen and a hacker gets in through an injection and they get a dump of your database and then they go and put it on Pastebin or a dark web version of Pastebin, uh, LifeLock is now scanning all of those, looking for you know Gunnard Ingebreth and seeing if my account's there and then alerting me and saying, hey, your stuff's on the, the internet. At this point in my life, everything's out there on the internet. I don't even care. Um, but it, attackers have access to all of this. We're going to see this in a second. And they have, they have all of your old passwords. They have all of your current passwords. OK, that's a little too much. They don't have all of your current passwords or all of your old passwords. But most likely, there's at least one password out there that you might have used before that's sitting in a, a text file somewhere. Um, and those can be used, especially if you use them across multiple accounts, Facebook, um, and then any of your utilities, you know, your email and um, Google, uh, Gmail or something. Using the same password, if it's out here in one of these files, it's not very good. But just the knowledge that they have all of the access to this data um, should be something. And again, if they have access to it, so do you. You can go and get this and check your systems to make sure that they're not vulnerable. So this just goes into session management and that applications should be able to check sessions. And you can't just, I don't think anybody does this anymore, but you can't just have a login and password that goes, all right, you're good. Like session variables are a thing. And um, something we should continue to do but also it is something that's out there and we can find websites right now i'm sure that just just kind of check against a unhashed database and we'll let you on this website so here's where rock you comes in everybody raise their hand if you've heard of rock you rock you is one of the most well-known password text files and it's got a pretty good history in december of 2009 the company rock you who developed games and applications for myspace and then moved over into facebook so this is just from a while ago the company experienced a data breach resulting in the exposure of over 32 million user accounts the company used an unencrypted database that's Problem number one, to store account data, including plain text passwords. No, no, no plain text. So as opposed to the password hashes, um, as well as passwords to connected accounts. So they have their account for Rock you, and then that account is connected to MySpace, and that password is in there as well. So we're talking, yeah, Facebook, MySpace, and webmail services. Rock you would also email the password unencrypted to the user during account recovery. These are all things that we kind of know in our mind, don't do this now, but when this was prevalent, 32 million user accounts were taken. So they also did not allow using special characters in their passwords. Um, the hackers used a 10 year old SQL vulnerability. So they have unencrypted passwords, they have linked unencrypted passwords, and they have a 10 year old known injection vulnerability that are all sitting out there. And they use that to gain access to the database. The company took days to notify users after the incident and initially incorrectly reported that the breach had only affected older applications when it actually affected all. All right, no good. So I'm going to try to get this quickly here, but XML internal uh, external entities are basically another attack vector where if you use XML and lots of legacy systems do, lots of current systems do, I know major things like I think UPS does, FedEx, those APIs still use SOAP and XML. Well, there's a part of XML where you can, uh, you can include external 
entities, files, uh, whatever you want. And so the easy thing is that you can turn this off, but it's in the configuration on the, the API's part. If the config is mismanaged, if it's incorrectly set, then the external entities are allowed. And what this leads to is the, excuse me, what this leads to is the fact that a hacker can go in and say, sure, you're calling this utility. Well, I want you to call this utility. This is one that I have control of. And now I own your API and I can access several different things or yeah, we're going to show you an example here in a second. So external entities, is the application vulnerable? The bottom line is yes. If, if it's XML, it is vulnerable. And what this can do at the bottom here, uh, being vulnerable to XXE attacks likely means that the application is vulnerable to a denial of service attack. So I might not just, I might not be able to get like your passwords or your database credentials, but I can just shut you down. And so the billion laughs attack is a denial of service attack that targets XML parsers. This is a very simple example of a very powerful attack. What it is, is an XML bomb or the exponential entity expansion attack. If you want to sound, if you're trying to use it in a, uh, you know, presentation or something. So let's look at what that does and how it blows up your system. So in XML it's very easy. What we're doing is we have the XML header, we have doc type naming it lulls, and then we have an entity that we're creating called lull. Cool. Next line. Okay, we're just we're creating an entity called lull2 and we're referencing lull 10 times. Okay, so now lull2 has 10 lulls in it. Sweet. Okay, lull3 now has 10 lull2s in it. And lol twos have ten L uh, lols in it. Okay. Okay, I see where we're going here. So now we're all the way down to lol nine, which has lol eights, and so on and so on. And then all we're doing is displaying we're calling the entity lol nine, which has a million lols if you've been doing the math in it. And this inevitably will kill a server. You get denial of service attacks, you get the 500 errors, all with these lines of code and all because your XML is vulnerable because it's been misconfigured and mismanaged. There's another one that's kind of direct to the point. Um, here's the, the external entity. And so we have doc type foo, cool, entity XSE system file Etsy password. So instead of, if you look at the third line, it's a, you know, stock check product ID and it calls this external entity. But in our case, we've modified it to where we want the Etsy password file. So instead of getting the product ID, we get all the passwords and I know the passwords are hashed and all that stuff, but we know account names at that point. We can want, run um, uh, Jack the Ripper. We can run several different cracking programs to get those passwords and get into your system. Three lines of code. All right, so really quickly here, got a few minutes left. Let's get into what, what we can do with that proactive versus reactive. How is developers, how can we be proactive in this? So <clears throat> OWASP, there's several of these kind of things out there, but OWASP did it first, I think, and does it great and it's free. So it's called the juice shop. What it is, is an e-commerce store but it's a whole training system. Once you go to it and you can install it locally if you want to, but you can use it also for free just on the web. It's an e-commerce system that they want you to hack and they guide you through it completely. Once you log in, once you get there, um, it tells you what it is and says, all right, let's go. And so the juice shop is, yeah, the first task within the juice shop is, well, let's find the scoreboard. How are you going to know like how you're progressing if you don't have a scoreboard? So the first task is let's find it. And they give you a nice pop-up that says, Hey, let's, let's look in the JavaScript code in the dev tools, your browser, and tells you how to open it up. This is, you know, right click inspect element, 
<clears throat> that kind of thing. Um, and they even say, or you can just start URL guessing. So our goal is to find the scoreboard URL. There's no links to it anywhere. Um, it's supposed to be for admins only. And so they say, all right, go find it. Let's look in the JavaScript. Cool, let's look in the JavaScript. So here are the JavaScript files that they are referencing within there. Uh, they all seem pretty standard. You know, runtime, polyfills, vendor, main. Cool. So what I did when I when I ran through this, I went through each one. Some of them are, you know, gulped and compressed and obfuscated, so you don't really know what's going on. So look for the ones that aren't. Um, so here's one that's just kind of compressed. It's not necessarily obfuscated. Um, and I don't know if you can see it or not, but what I did was once it opened up, I'm not going to look through all that. I'm just going to search. So I'm searching for the word score. And there's several hits that are highlighted there. But if we take a look at this one, right in the center of the screen, we have return um, dollar sign or hash, hash slash score dash board. So right, and it's set to a window location. We're returning it. It looks like exactly what we're looking for. So we just go back to the web page, type in slash score dashboard, and bam, we're in the scoreboard. And we see we have the first star, eight of nine filled up. That's the first step. And then here are the rest of what we are asked to do. Uh, access a confidential document, perform a DOM XSS attack with an iframe, read, read a privacy policy. That seems interesting. There's some more XSS attacks in there. Um, you can log in as admin as another one. You can set comments as a different user. They give you access to be able to do all of this. And, and by doing these, you're not necessarily gaining the skill as a pen tester or even as a hacker. What you're doing is it's hopefully should be triggering things in your mind of like, oh, I wrote code that, that does this or protects this. I wonder if that's vulnerable. Let me go back and look at it. Look at, you can start looking at your application the same way that you're looking at this. So I really like the G shop. It's super fun. Um, the examples again, broken authentication, broken access control, security misconfiguration, using components with known vulnerabilities, insufficient logging and monitoring. All of those will um, come into play when you use G shop. Second and last thing for OWASP, um, Zap. Zap is one of those scanners that I was talking about earlier. Again, it's free on their website. And I think everybody should use it. Go use it by the end of the day on your application to make sure it's secure. So it's the Z attack proxy. And basically, lots of buttons, lots of tabs, lots of things here. But it's not that difficult to run. And what this will do is scan your site for known vulnerabilities and different attack vectors. So on this next screen here, um, it's pretty easy, quick start, automated scan, and you put in the URL. And you can set some things, you know, is it Ajax, uh, Ajax Spider, Firefox Headless, what kind of agent are you using? And if it's your own or if it's on a local host, you can do it really quick or you can set different timing on it. It doesn't really matter, but let's see what some of the results are. So I'm running this on my own website um, I believe this was gunner, yeah, gunner.org. So at the top, we're getting we're getting all of these this feedback. We're getting the source code, and then the bottom pane are the results of the specific alerts that we should be looking at. Um, just going down the list, there's you know X frame options header not set, absence of anti CSRF tokens, cookie no HTTP only policy, crossed out domain JavaScript and source function file inclusion. Um, Couple down, looks like there's 416 checks for web browser XSS protection not enabled. This utility is very easy to get your hands on, very easy to learn and understand, and can save you super, super heartache and a headache um, if you find something that you can fix easily. And you know, you'll get a pat on the back at work. People will think you're looking out for, for the company and for your application, which you are. You don't want somebody in Russia or wherever, not picking on Russia, to run this, find the vulnerability, and then break into your site. 
you can check this. You almost have no excuse. As a developer, you not only should be proud of your code, but you should be proud of the security of your website. And here you have access to figure this stuff out. So yeah, just another picture. It's just, it's doing all of the hard work for you and you just get a nice report at the end. So in conclusion, all devs should be aware of this. Tell your friends, tell your team, go study up on it. I'm not an expert on this, but I'm telling y'all. So y'all should be advocates. I, I definitely argue for internal pen testing. You don't have to be an infosec person with a degree or a certificate or whatever. You don't have to necessarily hire a huge team to go and do stuff. You can run these programs yourself and learn a lot about your application. Uh, Zap, some things I didn't mention. Uh, Linpeas, Linpeas is a Linux um, privilege escalation program. It'll run against your site if you give it an IP address and it'll tell you how it's vulnerable to a privilege escalation. So if you get in as www data and you get to a command prompt, you might not necessarily be able to do anything, but if you run Linpeas, it'll tell you which systems are vulnerable for you to go in and then you're root, bam. Again, it's automated, it just happens. These you can run. Um, and Nmap, Nmap is pretty standard um, across the board. It tells you your, your open ports and services, file systems that are running, all of those things. It's a big tool, but there's a couple really easy scans just to get the basic information on how vulnerable your physical or virtual server might be. Um, use the OWASP top 10 as your security policy. Just take the, the bold headlines, go through that list and say, how do we want to treat this? How do we want to secure this? How do we want to address these problems and create your security policy from that? Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And I think that's a great head start instead of nothing. All right. And with that, I am done and we can... I'd say go ahead and start asking questions. Um, here's where you can find me. Again, these slides are up at gunnard.org slash 200 okay. Twitter at Gunnard. Instagram, I'm way more active on, uh, Gunnard E. Or just email me. But let me know if you have any questions or anything else. And yeah, with that, I am, I'm done. Rockin', thank you, Gunnard. Uh, we've got... Yeah. We've got six-ish questions. Um, okay, we'll start first with, uh, what are your thoughts on error monitoring services like TrackJS? Um, I think anything is better than nothing. Uh, I wouldn't specifically endorse or put anything behind any of them. Oh, sorry, that sounded weird. Uh, but yeah, anything is better than nothing. I typically just run tail-f. So something that would organize and show me consistencies and random spikes, um, a monitoring service like that, I'd be all for it, I think, I think is very good. Or at least a good start to know what you might need in the future. Gotcha. Uh, this is a little bit more broader one. Um, are there any classes or resources that you recommend to help us devs get basic knowledge of the tools that are available so that we can test and make our own apps more secure? Right. <clears throat> So there, there are, I think the juice shop is a very entry level, like easy to get your feet wet into like this mentality and looking at, at different things. It's a, it's a very typical store and application that we all have run into. So there's, there's parts of that that we can apply to what we're developing now. Um, having said that there's multiple websites out there that now specifically do just that. Um, there's, I think it's, well, I want to say it's like try hack me, but there's several different sites now that you log into and they give you VMs that you can SSH to, and they give you different challenges and tasks. They're specifically for people in the InfoSec community, but they're open to the public. And if you go through and look at them, there's different, different, um, excuse me, different tasks that can apply more to you. You might not directly be looking for how to implement a sudo privilege escalation, but you want to know how to attack a form 
on a website because that's what you have. You have forms on your website. So the answer is no, but there's a lot out there. Um, and there you have several, several different options, but I would say just try the OWASP G shop first. Gotcha. Um, so these are a little bit more specific. Uh, how can you prevent security misconfiguration like preventing letting users know that a website is a WordPress website? <laughs> Right. So in that case specifically, there there are some ways. Um, really not. It's I don't think there's a way to tell somebody that it's not a WordPress website. Bottom line, there's ways to make it more difficult. <clears throat> Getting rid of the WP slash admin page, changing it to another um, URL. But as you know, one of the quickest things that I do is I just hit control U, get to the source code, and you look for the first, you know, JavaScript um, source include, or look at the CSS, anything, and there's always a WP underscore. You know, within two seconds, you know, it's a WordPress site. So in general, it's hard, but, you know, how many people immediately go right to the source code? They might just look around at the website and go, hmm, it doesn't look like a WordPress website when it is. So, <clears throat> this is where you kind of have to be creative. And honestly, there, there's not a lot out there. No one's really trying to mask websites or um, give direct solutions to this. But think about it. You, you know, and you're a developer, so you're going in this one way. You're going to slash admin to get to the admin dashboard of your website. Maybe change it to something else. Or <clears throat> you can put HT access in place to where slash admin might work, but it's going to pop up with an HT access password. That you have to put in first. Um, basically, doing anything to where it's not an obvious admin, dashboard, back end, super user access only, something like that. Get rid of those and just change it to something one off. Doesn't have to be amazingly secure. Or, I mean, like, it doesn't have to be 13 characters, all uppercase, lowercase, crazy letters. Just make it different than the normal. Um, you know, what if your admin dashboard was in slash pants? How many people would guess pants as the admin login? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. I, uh, was it like obscurity through or security through obscurity? Kind of exactly. Thought. Yeah. No. I yeah. There's it. there's another there's another XKCD on the passwords and why they don't like the passwords with uppercase lowercase numbers and all that, and uh, that's. I've adopted that honestly. So I have this like really long password, but it's just words. One that, of those. Is it the, the $5 wrench? Um, uh, yeah. All right. So uh, <laughs> let's, let's keep going. Uh, can an attacker use an XML entity attack uh, to trick your backend into uh, DDoSing itself by referencing an entity on localhost? That was a mouthful. Let me know if I can. <laughs> That that is a mouthful, and uh, yeah, I mean, on on your local host or its local host. I mean, I would assume that you'd want it on theirs, and you can do that if you're if you're you, if you're accessing an entity. It could be a script, it could be anything, and as long as it runs on that server and is clogging up enough um, pipes or CPU or memory, so if somehow it can connect to your computer, which I mean, I don't know if you'd want to do that because that's a trail back to you, but it could do that as well. If it's accessing something that it doesn't have access to, it's going to keep trying. Either way, the concept of accessing a file on that machine is should not be um, something that's happening. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, more on attack vectors. Uh, can you generally uh, exfiltrate information uh, like SQL variants, stored procedure names, et cetera? with URL injection techniques. So yeah, yeah this kind of goes on two of them, URL injection and also the, um, the, the access control and monitoring. So I've seen examples before where if you, you try to inject something and then you get a MySQL error and it returns the error string and the error string will tell you, well, that, that column is not available in this table name. Well, great, now I just have a column and table name. So I'm gonna keep trying with different letters of the alphabet, different things. So eventually I've seen an entire MySQL database schema read out through the error messages in MySQL. 
So all they're doing is attacking, getting errors, and then realizing that MySQL, the error is set to like one, you know, one or two instead of zero. So that it's actually putting the errors out there for you. So the answer is, yeah, you can totally do that. You can get the entire database dump just from the errors. Um, so turn, turn that off, turn MySQL errors off. <laughs> Wait, so is that like, that's like the thousand monkeys in a room kind of thing where they just continue to ask it until you get it all right? Right, yeah, yeah, basically. You just <laughs> kind of keep going through everything and it's like, no, that's not there, but this is. I'm like, okay, thanks. Oh, that's wild. <laughs> Um, okay, well, I think this is the last question. Um, do you have, uh, what do you use for uh, automating tailing a log? Um, I'd straight up just, so start with tail, tail dash F. Tail dash F keeps it going. And I use Tmux in my terminal. So I have, you know, multiple windows open. Uh, if you Google, you know, tailing logs, uh, custom or highlight, like there's a lot of great little one line scripts out there that'll highlight IP addresses or cut down on a lot of the miscellaneous information and just give you a nice output. And so play around with those and get a nice one line script that you like. Um, but I just start tail dash F is my, my go to um, every day. Gotcha. Um, well, I think that's it. Uh, I would like to note, um, so uh, in my role at, at Mozilla, I've worked a lot on uh, Monitor, uh, which, you know, basically ingests habit been phone breaches and sends it out to folks. And so it's interesting to see it from the other angle, I feel like, for this. For this <laughs> I love it. I'm getting to, get to see the other side of it. Nice. <laughs> uh, and again, where, uh, where can we find more information about you? <clears throat> More information is at gunnard.org slash 200 okay, the name of this conference. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, gunnard, at gunnard, and Instagram, gunnard e. Uh, like I said, just Google gunnard and pretty much a couple first links, it'll be me somewhere and you can find me. Rocking. Well, uh, again, we all appreciate you uh, talking today and uh, we'll, uh, we'll check those out. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day.